Thank you very much. And uh, if I can echo the sentiments that an awful lot of people have no doubt given, uh, it would lovely. It would be lovely to be with you all in Sofia. Um, thank you for uh, for all of you for attending and for our small audience that attends in in person. I will try very hard to see if I can share my screen. I think it's that one. There we go, and I'll put it on full uh, full mode. Hopefully, where have we gone? So I just put it on display mode. Just bear with me a moment. So I'm just juggling around my screen a little bit. There we go. Can someone just tell me that I'm I'm on full screen there? Is that all right? Yes. It is excellent. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the invite. Um, as uh, as just uh, uh, introduced there, my name's uh, Darren. Um, I'm professor of genetics at the University of Kent. Uh, this is my dog who's joining me today. He's called Gilbert. Uh, and I am going to give you a little bit about chromosomes, a little bit about pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, and we might even get um, this rather unsavory character a bit of a mention somewhere along the line. So without further ado then, um, the... Uh, let me put a laser pointer, there we go. Um, aneuploidy is one of the biggest genetic hazards that we have uh, facing us as humans at the moment it is the leading cause of mental retardation in humans with something like one in 700 children born with Downs, the leading cause of pregnancy loss, obstetric complications. It can lead to imprinting syndromes, infertility, and is probably the leading cause of IVF failure. So in principle, you would have thought, um, with the possible exception of delightful people like uh, this young man here, by and large, uh, we should use all the tools at our disposal to eliminate it from IVF embryos. So theoretically, um, that's what we should do, but is it really that simple? Which leads us to pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy or PGTA. Now, essentially what this involves is the screening of IVF embryos for chromosome abnormalities, and the idea is to prevent genetic affected live births, to prevent miscarriage, and to prevent IVF failure. So in, in, to put it another way, to try and improve your, um, uh, your chances of IVF. And what it involves is the biopsy of, traditionally, it was one cell from an eight cell embryo as here. Um, these days, it is um, uh, from a, a slightly later stage, the blastocyst stage, the principle is the same. You get a diagnosis that is normal, which we depicted in green here, we transfer the embryo, whereas if you get a diagnosis, a diagnosis of abnormal, we don't. Now, um, through the ages, it's changed a little bit. Um, we can biopsy the embryo, as I mentioned, an eight cell by taking just a single cell. We can biopsy the polar body uh, from the egg, but more commonly now we do true affected biopsy from, the, uh, from a blastocyst embryo, partly because that gets us uh, a number of cells and partly because it doesn't damage the embryo quite so much. The way that we used to do the diagnosis is splat the embryo down onto a glass slide and do fluorescence in situ hybridization or fish. And in this case, you can see we've got one, two, three red dots. Hope you can see that. And that would be indicative of a, an embryo with Down syndrome. Or more commonly these days, we put the, air, the cell or cells into a tube, amplify them by whole genome amplification, and then use either a ray CGH, next generation sequencing, or a SNP chip based approach um, interpreting it as something like uh, a technique that we call carry mapping. What sort of patients is it for? Well, those with advanced maternal age, because advanced maternal age, particularly over 35, is associated with uh, increased aneuploidy for recurrent pregnancy loss, for recurrent implantation failure. Some suggestions that it could be used for male, in factor, male factor infertility patients and some people have suggested that maybe all IVF cycles should be, um, uh, should be performed in this way. But there are a number of issues. The first is chromosomal mosaicism. What happens when you have in your embryo, some cells that are normal chromosomally and some that are abnormal. The second question is how do we interpret the data, particularly those of randomized controlled trials? And I'll go into that in some detail. We need to address the issue of whether taking some cells from the embryo has a damaging effect on it. We need to address the issue of very stubborn people and also the fact that our regulator, the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority, has set up this so-called traffic light system that um, tries to inform uh, whether 
people should do procedures like uh, um, PGTA. So this is the issue of mosaicism. Um, sometimes you can have normal and abnormal and normal cells in the same embryo. Indeed, that's really quite commonplace. And if you take a sample from here, which is your trophectoderm, the bit that will go on and form the placenta, the extent to which it re represents here, um, the inner cell mass, the bit that will go and form the fetus, is the subject of some debate. So here it wouldn't, here it wouldn't, here it wouldn't, and here it wouldn't, but here it would. So this is the overview of my talk. I'm going to start with a, two, a couple of psychological terms and getting our definitions right. I'll talk a little bit about mosaicism and address the question, are all human embryos mosaic? And if so, what happens to the amniploid cells? I'll talk a little bit about embryo biopsy, the removal of cells. I'll talk about the evidence base of PGTA, randomized controlled trials and regulators, a little bit about what we tell our patients before concluding with some remarks about how we might, what we might all agree upon. So let's do the first of those. Now, this is a book to read before you die. I would strongly recommend you read it. It's by Scott Adams, which many of you recognize as the author of the Dilbert cartoons. You may also recognize this individual here, and it is largely based around why they managed to win the 2016 election. And it is a wonderful insight into human nature. And why we as humans sometimes do things badly. And two of those reasons are some very uh, innate uh, characteristics that in many ways, most or indeed all of us have. The first is called cognitive dissonance, and the second is called confirmational bias. So cognitive dissonance might be described as you know and believe something, yet your actions are not only contrary to those beliefs, but you seek to justify them. So an example might be, everybody listening to this will know that smoking is bad for them. I imagine that a few of you are smokers, but in the back of your mind, do some of you sort of justify it in a way, well, I had an uncle who lived till he was 90, and uh, he um, uh, perfectly healthy for the whole of his life. Um, confirmational bias is a little bit more easy to describe. Essentially, this is picking on the bits of evidence that you want to believe in order to bolster your own point of view. So these two things are similar but different. And uh, Scott Adams's point is that the one thing that Donald Trump does is manage to bring out these features in us more than most people could do, and it hence is a very persuasive individual as a result. Sometimes in, uh, in the face of the, um, uh, of the known evidence. So um, I'd like to introduce you to two imaginary humans. So the humans themselves are not imaginary, they are um, a former PhD student and a postdoc in my lab, but back in 2007 I introduced you to, to them, and everything else I'm going to tell you about you about them, tell you about them, is completely imaginary. So uh, Jacob here in this imaginary scenario hates PGTA and Giuseppe absolutely loves it. So we entitled this, um, uh, this manuscript somewhat tongue in cheek, Jacob versus Giuseppe, and made the point that, yes, of course, we're not all going to have the same point of view. We will have a range of opinions. But when it pertains to PGTA, you'd like to hope that if there was empirical evidence Against PGTA, we would go a little bit more towards Jacob and empirical evidence supporting PGTA, a little bit more towards Giuseppe, but by and large, we hope that there would be a bell-shaped curve or normal distribution, roughly. Now, this is not an empirical study on my part. I have to say I'm just having a little bit of fun here, but what I tend to observe is that when there's empirical evidence about PGTA, be it for or against, I've never seen an issue polarize opinion quite so much. And this really cannot be healthy in science. And then the other thing I want to um, introduce here is that when you read a paper on PGTA, often the definitions are wrong. So I want to just try and put some textbook definitions into your head in, um, in the hope that this will help clarify what I'm going to say the rest of the time. Euploid is a chromosomally normal cell or population of cells. A neuploid is a cell or population with an extra or missing chromosomes. A mosaic is a population of cells which is not chromosomally the same. So at least one cell is chromosomally different from the rest. 
So if you think about it, then an embryo can theoretically be uniformly aneuploidy with all the cells normal, uniformly euploid, sorry, with all the cells normal, uniformly aneuploid with all the cells abnormal but identical, or mosaic. Okay. Mosaic can be euploid aneuploid, so some normal, some abnormal cells, all aneuploid but different to one another. So let's say some trisomy 21, some are trisomy 18, or complex and chaotic. And complex and chaotic is really quite common in human embryos. Um, so if an embryo is mosaic, by definition, it is aneuploid. And people don't um, always uh, appreciate that. But what you'll often see in a paper is someone saying, this embryo is aneuploid, or it's normal, or it's mosaic, which actually is incorrect. The reason why I think it's incorrect is that if you take a five cell sample of a 200 cell embryo and all the cells are, are the same, you do not have a Scooby-Doo about whether that embryo is em uh, mosaic or not. Your diagnosis is that of your biopsy, not necessarily of the whole of your embryo. Like any biopsy result, it can only ever best be a reasonable proxy for the mosaicism status of the rest of the embryo. So as I showed you a moment ago, um, there will always be some misdiagnosis, and this is why we used to call PGTA PGS, because the PGS was pre-implantation genetic screening, which leads me then to muse on mosaicism a little bit. Now, uh, I saw this uh, doing around uh, a little bit and modified it slightly. Um, imagine that uh, you're looking at um, uh, a sprinkler and this person here is looking at the sprinkler through the hole in the wall. He thinks everything is abnormal. And this is sometimes the view of social media. But we as scientists, of course, have got to try and get up a ladder and look at the bigger picture. And, and many of us do dedicate our lives to doing this. However, what seems to happen amongst many of my, my colleagues, some of which I, I love to pieces, but nonetheless, um, I think many, often they can be a little bit uh, misguided in all of this, is that if you look through here and see aneuploidy, there are uh, a few people who would say, well, aneuploidy, that's what it is in the embryo. I've taken five cells. I've looked at a little window. Therefore, mosaicism doesn't exist in this embryo. And some actually say that mosaicism doesn't exist at all. And some studies will say, right, okay, I've taken five cells from a 200 cell blastocyst. Five out of five cells are euploid in a proportion of my embryos and I'll call that X. Five out of five cells are uniformly aneuploid and I'll call that Z, um, the incidence of that Z. But sometimes I get some that are normal and some are abnormal. So some maybe one is normal and five are abnormal or vice versa, or we might get some uh, variation on that theme. And then they will say, therefore, the true incidence of mosaicism is Y over X plus Y plus Z times 100%. Now, all I can say to that is as follows. And at this point, I'd like to introduce um, my friend and colleague, Ben Skinner, former PhD student of mine, now at the University of Essex, who developed this lovely little thing. It's just um, a virtual embryo. And if anybody wants to, to play with this, you're welcome to have a copy. Um, you start by say, by programming the number of cells just by putting it in here. You say how many cells are aneuploid. It's 40% uh, in this case. And then we ask how many, what sort of clumping do we have? So you would expect aneuploid cells to be close to one another if this is a clonal event. So if uh, we've had an otherwise normal embryo that's undergone a segregation area, uh, error and then the um, the daughter cells of that cell to be similarly aneuploid you expect them to be closer to one another and then we biopsy from that and then we say um, how many are in this example uh, five normal four plus one normal three plus two normal abnormal and so on yeah. so in this case we did 300 iterations in which we had 20 percent abnormality so we basically biopsied our embryo, um, uh, biopsied our embryo 300 times, and um, uh, of the 200 cells, 40 were, uh, were aneuploid. And in this case, our results were as follows. Nearly as many times as we got the so-called true result, we got uh, five normal, 
we got a significant proportion that were three normal, two abnormal, and a little bit uh, more this, a little bit more this. We didn't get any that were um, five uh, normal. Then one of the things that we sort of um, found was the more our cells were in proximity, our abnormal cells, the more this one went down and the more everything else went up. So the incidence of mosaic in human embryos is, is in fact the total number that are mosaic over the total number times 100%. Whereas the level of mosaicism is a proportion of euploid versus aneuploid cells. So this is like looking at the population, the first bullet point. The second is looking at the individual embryos. Now, one of the things I'm going to try and convince you to say to, um, today is that the level per embryo is unlikely to be naught or 1%. So in other words, the incidence is at or close to 100%. But nonetheless, a biopsy result is a reasonable proxy for the level of mosaicism on average. And the greater proportion of abnormal and euploid cells, the greater the likelihood of IVF failure. Now, those um, technologies I showed you a moment ago, the FISH, the Erase GH, the NGS, and the SNP chips, can we use those to look at aneuploidy? Well, FISH, although it's the most primitive of all the technologies, and you wouldn't really use it in as a diagnostic test at the moment, isn't bad at all at detecting mosaicism, provided you take into account it has an error rate and so on. So if you want to look at a few chromosomes, um, but all the cells in the embryo, it's probably still the best way. Array CGH, the trace is a little bit too messy. NGS is pretty good um, at detecting um, 20 or even 10% uh, mosaicism pretty, pretty well, um, but you do have to disaggregate your cells. SNP chips, not the best um, to do that. So our most primitive and one of our most um, uh, contemporary methodologies are perhaps the same of doing that. The best for doing that. Now, at this point, I wanted to take you back to my PhD thesis. And yes, I really did uh, look this young. This is my friend and colleague, uh, Dagan Wells, who is uh, exceptionally well known in the IVF field. So this is a page from my PhD thesis. And um, this is the X chromosome probe. Um, so this is two nuclei staying with DAPI. And then the filters change, seeing one X chromosome in each. But this nucleus here, has two X chromosomes. It is male, we know it's male because the rest of the, uh, the cells are, are male, so it's not two X chromosomes because it's, um, uh, because it's female, it's two X chromosomes because it's either got a sex chromosome abnormality or more likely it's tetraploid. So in this case, in these male embryos, most of the time we see one signal because we're expecting to see it, but sometimes we see two, occasionally we see four and sometimes five plus. And then the same is when we, the female embryos, when we were expecting to see that. Um, so this, we published this back in human reproduction in 1991. So what we can do is revisit some of the literature and get a reasonable estimate of what the overall um, incidence of mosaicism uh, is in humans. So um, if you take the fish studies, and you start with your 23, um, uh, your total numbers of chromosomes that you studied. So some were using four color fish, some were using six color fish and so on. Um, take 23, because that's 23 um, pairs of chromosomes, divide by the number of chromosomes that you studied, you get some sort of uh, idea of, about what you need to take into account. Um, you need to um, take into account your fish error rate, any sort of overlaps, and you can get a reasonable estimate of how many um, embryos you expect to be mosaic, have at least one abnormal cell. Um, with NGS studies, you can start with your Y of X plus Y plus Z, plus Z, but you need to take into account the number of cells in each embryo, the number of cells in your biopsy, and then the degree of juxtaposition of aneuploid cells. And occasionally studies have taken embryos apart cell by cell, and looked at the level of, of abnormality. Occasionally studies have done wonderful um, uh, multiple um, fish experiments. But I'm gonna try and convince you now that I've been looking at the cytogenetics of human embryos for over 30 years now. We've taken a very close look at the evidence from all the studies, and you certainly wouldn't be a million miles away off the mark 
by making a very bold statement that every human embryo is mosaic and therefore amoeboid. At least IVF embryos. Uh, no one's really looked at um, in vivo uh, generated embryos, but more so at day three, the, the cleavage stage, than day five, the blastus stage. So a human embryo is chromosomally, karyotypically diverse, fluid, and dynamic. And we know that if we transfer um, embryos that we have diagnosed in our biopsy with a low level mosaicism, they can lead to live birth rates. So you see there are reasonably good IVF um, success rates in these studies. So really what we want to avoid is this sort of scenario, and it does exist with people saying every mosaic, never transfer it, just discard it. And equally, we want to avoid the issue of um, saying mosaicism doesn't exist at all. Um, and some people would, would argue that. And this is um, some data from uh, Andrea Victor, who's a PhD student of mine, uh, also Manuel Man Man Biotti, who suggests that on average, if you don't spot mosaicism in your five of your 200 cells, even if it's there, you will get a pregnancy rate in their hands of over 50%. If you have between 20 and 40% um, mosaicism in your biopsy, that's suggestive that overall, you're, the level of chromosome uh, cells with chromosomes abnormality is a little higher. So your pregnancy rate is thus a little lower. And then if it's over 50%, between 50 and 80%, then it's a little lower still. But in another study, which I'm going to mention to you in a moment, if all your cells are aneuploid in that biopsy, then the likelihood is that the pregnancy rate will be close to zero. And you can break it down into whole chromosome abnormalities and segmental abnormalities and get a picture, something similar. So how do we deal with um, when we get a diagnosis that is mosaic? I think we just need to be a bit sensible. Uh, Catherine Sanders in my lab, is, we've just um, uh, submitted the corrections to a paper that suggests that it's only seven to eight percent of uh, cases in which you only have a mosaic uh, ab uh, abnormality uh, available for transfer. You need to remember that it's probably mosaic somewhere anyway. And this is just something that Andrea and Manuel developed, is that if you have a very low level mosaic, what are the chances of implantation? and then the extent to which you take into account the morphology of the embryo, which is what IVF uh, practitioners do every day. One thing you don't wanna do is um, if you have a beautiful embryo that in your biopsy only has one cell uh, that's abnormal, prioritize that over a really horrible looking embryo that just happens to have five cells that are normal. So be a little bit sensible. So these aneuploid cells, what happens? Well. We've known for some time through fish studies that the level of chromosome abnormality in day five embryos and beyond is lower than it is at day three and day four. And this is the study that we are just doing the corrections for at the moment, that we hope to publish in human reproduction. And it gives a very clear insight to what happens to these amyloid cells. So we started at cleavage stage and we've taken one cell from it. About half, 48% were euploid. So these were taken on to blastocyst stage and 70% of them blastolated with a 59% pregnancy rate. 30% de de degenerated and were discarded. Of the ones in which we took a cell and it was aneuploid, again, that was about half of them, much greater proportion degenerated and discarded and were discarded. But we had these 174 embryos that, blast that blastolated and we analyzed those by next generation sequencing in four structures, the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm, but also these peripheral cells surrounding the embryo, as well as the blastocele fluid here. And we find something really funky. But in the inner cell mass, um, remember we started with one cell that was abnormal, okay? Then um, we let the embryo develop, it blastulated, and then we said, right, is the abnormality in the inner cell mass of the same chromosome? And 41% of the time it was. 57% of the time, however, it was normal. 
it had normalized. And then 3% of the time, we saw some other abnormality. In the trophectodome, the picture was somewhat similar, except there were slightly more abnormalities in the, um, uh, in the, uh, uh, in, in general, in, in the trophectodome, slightly more abnormalities, but again, they were perfectly concordant almost every time. In the cells surrounding the blastocyst, then far more abnormalities again, again, concordant with the original diagnosis and far less normalization. And then in the blastocele, um, the greatest number of abnormalities with very few normalized. So what we think happens is that the blastocysts, when they have an anormal cell, they push it away from the inner cell mass towards the trophectoderm, or most, most likely into the blastocele fluid and into these peripheral cells surrounding it. Hold that thought. Okay, right, if we're pulling cells off an embryo, does that damage the embryo? Well, to answer that question, um, I'm just gonna refer you to this. I don't uh, expect you to read every word, but essentially these are tips and tricks for if you do embryo biopsy as put together by some excellent um, embryologists. Now, all I want to make the point there is that is a very, very long list. Now, what this says to me is if you don't follow this, then yes, absolutely, you can damage your embryo and you can make PGTA not work. So of, of course, embryo biopsy can damage the embryo. If you've got um, a ham-fisted embryologist, it can cause compromised embryo development. It makes it less likely for a lab to return, um, uh, or more likely to return an unclear result. Colin Lynch in my uh, group uh, established that. And then, of course, studies that do it badly will never show a benefit of PGTA, even if it's a randomized controlled trial. So it doesn't matter how well designed, how well designed your trial is, that if it doesn't, um, if it's performed badly, then um, it ain't going to work. But if you do it well, follow guidelines like this, then the evidence suggests that it should not damage the embryo, but you need a, properly, uh, a proper quality assessment scheme. So does PGTA work at all? And why I suggest to you here is that times change. And when times change, facts change. What do you do when the facts change? Do you change your mind? So this is a summary of the evidence base for PGTA. There are about 100 retrospective, mostly single center studies that not using fish, fish is gone now, use a race EGH or NGS that report a beneficial effect of PGTA. But the measure is pregnancy rate per embryo transfer. There are something like eight randomized controlled trials out there. And it's fair to say that the, the um, message is a little bit mixed. I don't expect you to read every word of this table here, but basically green means there's some positive news for PGTA, red means that there's some negative news. I want to introduce you to a non-selection trial. I mentioned this briefly a moment ago. When embryos that are aneuploid, so this is when five out of five cells from the biopsy has been uh, established are aneuploid, this is the um, brown line here, the biochemical pregnancy rate is here at about uh, 50%, fetal heartbeat at about 20%, um, live birth rate absolutely zero. Compare that to when uh, normal cells are, are found in the, in the biopsy, much, much higher. A similar study that we did in my lab um, in cattle established something similar, that if you make a diagnosis of complete aneuploidy, five out of five cells, your chances of live birth are very, very low. There are multi center analysis like the SART data, which I'm showing here. So this is SART that suggests that in the under 35s, pregnancy rate per embryo transfer isn't that beneficial, but in the over 35s, it is. And this reflects the, uh, the results of the STAR trial, which is the one on the, um, uh, second from the right here, that suggests that there is a beneficial effect in the over 35s. But not everyone believes this because this was not a, an intent to treat criteria from the outset. Now, this is some data that we've just published in JARG just uh, two weeks ago, 
in which we did a freedom of information request to the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority and said, of your 190,000 IVF cases between 2016 and 2018 and your 2,500 PGTA, what was the percentage live birth per embryo transfer? And what was the percentage live birth per cycle? And you can see in each of these cases, the answer was the percentage live birth rate was significantly higher. So two asterisks means that it was point, uh, the p-value was less than 0 0.001. One asterisk means that it's less than 0 0.05. So even in the under 35s, we saw significant effect. Now, this is not a randomized trial. This is just all the cases. They were not matched. But the only way that this would be the case that PGS, PGTA um, is not effective is um, if we were deliberately or inadvertently choosing much better prognosis patients. Now, anecdotally, you don't do that. You don't take um, uh, good prognosis patients. PGTA cases tend to be less, uh, less good prognosis patients. So what we might do in the future is see if we can match these a little bit more closely um, and be a little bit more convincing. But quite frankly, not only the differences between the blue and uh, green bars, but also the fact that there is a very clear association with maternal age here in both of these leads me to suggest to you that when we're talking about um, pregnancy rate per embryo transfer or pregnancy rate per uh, cycle, then it certainly does work. Now, why are the RCTs not necessarily showing that? Now, RCTs are necessary to eliminate the question of any bias. In non-RCTs, therefore, we need to consider whether bias is likely or even possible. You know, are clinicians inadvertently selecting more fertilized patients for PGTA? In our study, as I suggested to you, it seems unlikely. Now, many of you will be, be aware there's a recent publication out just last week or the week before in the New England Journal of Medicine that suggests that PGTA does not work. Okay, well, reason why it doesn't work is first of all, they use good prognosis patients, which it was not meant for. The average age of the patients is 29, but importantly, their outcome measure was cumulative pregnancy rate. Okay, now cumulative pregnancy rate means, do you get pregnant if you keep trying? Well, any method that is used to select the best embryo for transfer cannot possibly show an effect of positive effect of cumulative pregnancy rate, because eventually you will pick the good embryo if you keep trying. So of course, this um, uh, study shows no effect of um, a PGTA. But what does our regulator, the HFEA say? And eventually, uh, initially, they gave it two red lights. But when you dig into what they actually did, and I have presented this to them, first of all, they didn't award any green lights at all. And importantly, there were no provision for green lights. So um, they sort of said, well, uh, if it meets our, all our criteria for a green light, it comes routine, so we won't put it on our list. So these is not just PGTA, but other innovations in the world of IVF. One of the committee members said, there is no evidence that will convince me that PGTA is effective. Um, which, you know, is not a good thing for a scientist to say. Um, they didn't really acknowledge the non-selection trial. They used the phrase, the phrase, no evidence it's effective. Well, mm, factually incorrect. No evidence that an RCT, uh, from an RCT, improves uh, to pregnancy rate is what they should have said. Because realistically, patients are not necessarily looking as cumulative pregnancy rate as their only outcome. They want to be into the clinic and pregnant at the earliest possible opportunity. If you ask an IVF patient, they would tell you that. So an approach designed to select the best embryo will only ever get a red light for cumulative pregnancy rate. Also, I pointed out to them that they do license the use of PGTA, um, the, the regulator, but then to give it red lights, this is not a good luck. Now, when I've been and to the HFEA and addressed them to them, they have been very gracious, they've listened, they remove one of the red lights and they've softened some of their wording. And they've been lovely and wonderfully gracious to me, but there's still some ways to go. Which then leads us to the question of what do we tell our patients? I think it's important to say we tell our patients the facts. 
First of all and foremost, I am pretty convinced that many, all and possibly all human embryos are mosaic and therefore have some degree of aneuploidy in them. The more aneuploid cells you have, the more likely to be IVF failure. But PGTA provides a window. It is a biopsy and nothing more. Now, I think for advanced maternal age, uh, PGTA is effective and safe according to most lines of evidence. For the other three, okay, it's complex because um, for instance, recurrent implantation failure, recurrent pregnancy loss, you also have the influence of the, um, of the endometrium. So um, it's really quite complex. But given the non-selection trials, do we really want to be transferring an embryo that has no chance of live birth or reduced chance of live birth? Do we want to use it in routine IVF? So use it for every single IVF uh, case? I think not yet, but I was actually just in uh, Dubai last week and one of my colleagues from Abu Dhabi, in fact, was saying that that's exactly what they do. So it may become a prospect, but we also need to tell our patients that these HFEA traffic lights that have said, give PGTA a red light and some other procedures red light that they have been heavily criticized by me um, amongst others. So the things we can agree upon, even though there's huge argument about PGTA is that we do not do cleavage stage biopsy at day three, okay? Nor do we do fish anymore. Even the labs that are good at it, good at it is too prone to embryo damage and misdiagnosis. Uh, but sometimes you will see uh, and there's at least one very good exa example out there, a systematic review of the literature, a Cochrane review that says PGTA is not great because it includes all of these studies of day three biopsy and fish. Okay, PGTA will never increase cumulative pregnancy rate. Everyone agrees on that. What sometimes they disagree, however, on is whether cumulative pregnancy rate is the thing that patients are looking for. There is mounting evidence that PGTA improves pregnancy rate per cycle for embryo transfer, time to first pregnancy, miscarriage rate. And the evidence is strongest with increasing maternal age. Yes, we need RCTs. Some colleagues may wish to wait for them, but to say you shouldn't do this because I am um, then um, is a little bit disingenuous in my, my view. These non-selection trials are very, very compelling. I don't think there's enough evidence to justify PGTA routinely in all IVF cases, but it may be coming. But the one thing uh, I would say to the community is please don't use phrases like no evidence or mosaicism doesn't exist. That does not help the argument. It's just winding people up. So I want to end now with some future considerations. Um, people often use word like the truth and true um, level of mosaicism. If we're looking for truth, then maybe we should be looking, trying philosophy. We need to be looking for the facts, okay? And facts change with the changing evidence. We've been arguing about PGTA for, for 20 years now, and no one can be completely right. It is okay for us to have differences of opinion, but absolutism has no place in science. So I talked to you at the beginning about cognitive dissonance, confirmation bias, we need to cut this out. We always, in any uh, area of science, need to constantly examine our opinions in the light of the evidence. And we always need to make um, to be appreciate that we might be mistaken. And this is not happening in the world of PGTA, unfortunately. There is more to agree upon than to disagree upon. And let's just think about our wonderful colleagues in the world of, of virology and immunology in the last year or two. They have been exemplary scientists. I think you know what I'm talking about. It really is time that we did likewise. And with that, I will end. Thank you very much indeed. Sure, is it? Thank you very much, Professor Griffin, for this brilliant presentation, which help, will help uh, a lot in counseling our patients before PGT. Uh, and now I give the opportunity for the audience to ask questions. So are there questions? Yes, we have one question. Professor Chaveva wants to ask you something. Uh, good evening, everyone. 
uh, Professor Green, thank, thank you very much for your brilliant talk. My question is related to the use of uh, pre implantation genetic testing. Does this increase as a future the risk of um, structural defects in the subsequent pregnancy, or uh, is it related to any adverse pregnancy outcome? Me personally, I'm a fetal medicine specialist, and very often the patients want to know from us uh, if they have future in the lab, how these imply into the, into the ongoing pregnancy. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, unfortunately, you, you cut out some key points there. If, if I um, Did anyone get the full question? I got about three quarters of it. The question is about uh, the structural defects following the biopsy of the embryo. Do you have some data about this? So, so does embryo biopsy induce structural defects? Yes. Is that the question? Okay, right, excellent. Um, sorry, I just wanted to make sure because there is screening for structural abnormalities in patients as well. I want to make sure you weren't talking about that. So um, does it induce it? I think it can. Um, and I think if it's done bad, badly, with overuse of the laser, um, then it is possible. Equally, if it's done properly, then it shouldn't. And these very gentle, like the flicking techniques, as far as I'm aware, um, they are very, very good for um, having as little damage as possible. So one of the things that's often noticeable is if, if um, uh, an embryologist has been very sort of rough with the embryo and, and use the laser a lot, then often it can lead to a a very unclear result. So it's much harder for the diagnostic lab to get those beautiful traces. And uh, um, and therefore you would assume that um, it would uh, it would also um, induce um, perhaps not a structural abnormality in the embryo itself, but a structural abnormality in the biopsy that would lead you to believe that there's a structural abnormality in the embryo itself. So I, don't think unless an embryologist is really, really rough that it can um, induce abnormalities in the embryo, but it, you might be able to find evidence in, in, for that because they've been quite rough in taking the biopsy, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Professor Sterev has a question. Professor. Do you hear me? I can hear you now, yeah. Hmm? Uh, Professor Griffin, I want only to thank you for this excellent lecture. We have in our hospital about uh, 17, 20 young doctors, and your presentation this evening show how to make presentation and how to ask for uh, evidence and uh, to manage uh, data in our clinical practice in, in, in science also. Thank you, Mark, again. Okay, you're very kind. Thank you very much. Okay, we don't have more questions. Thank you again for this wonderful talk, Professor Griffin. Thank you very much. Bye. And bye from bye. my dog. There we go. <laughs>